talk about a, uh, some new event spaces for psychological uh, experimentation. And these will mesh with some of the things that were um, talked about and uh, argued about. I might be a better way of saying it. And uh, the presentations on uh, quantum logic. Uh, I have a long-term research project. <coughs> I've been involved in a long research project was to uh, generalize probability theory through investigations on the algebraic relationships of probability and logic. What I was interested in is how the concept of probability influences logic. It adds something to logic that wasn't there. Maybe it ha adds nothing, but I tend to find that it adds something, and I wanted to investigate this. What I mean by logic is usually standard propositional logic that we talked about. In event spaces, that's a Boolean algebra of events. So when I talk about logic, I also mean the structure of an event space. We usually uh, assume it to be a Boolean algebra, and I'll talk more about that. Okay, so I'm going to generalize the, um, both the probability function and the algebra of the underlying event space. So in classical finitely additive probability theory, we have an event space that is a Boolean algebra of events, and we have a probability space that is a finite uh, measure on that space. It's a rather uh, uh, a simple kind of structure, but the first thing to note is that in the definition of probability function, nowhere is the complementation operator mentioned. You only have intersections and unions, and you're not using complementation. So what is the role of complementation? Well, the role of complementation is that if you don't have complementation, you can find examples where you don't have any disjoint events, and therefore you can never use this formula. For this formula to be effective, you have to have lots and lots of disjoint events. But there are situations where we don't want to have lots of disjoint events. Just very practical situations. For example, if you have uh, n propositions, you can have two to the two to the nth number of events. For something like 10 propositions, it's you can fill up the universe with atoms or electrons or something. It's just you get enormous number of things in the event space. And part of the thing that they do in computer science is they want to cut down the size of the event space to only the things that are most relevant. And the ones that are most relevant may not form a Boolean algebra. It would be nice to be able to handle probability theory on cutting things down. So you don't have negation? I'm not saying you don't have negation. I'm just saying if you throw that's the role of negation. We're going to change the role of negation. Uh, the other uh, sort of thing is, is that there's other logics that has been considered by philosophers and that um, are not Boolean algebras, uh, where we still can have a good sense of probability. There are, of course, other logics where maybe a good sense, a workable scientific sense of probability is not useful. But there are other logics where we can have a good sense of probability, and I'll talk about these. Okay. So um, the generalization of uh, of uh, logic that I will be using, I'll take what von Neumann considered to be the most elementary kind of uh, logic that one would want, and still call it a logic. And these are the rules, but more importantly, it has uh, a union, an intersection-like operator. You can read this as or and an. This is true and that's false. It sort of corresponds to union, intersection, the sure event, the empty s event, and, uh, and uh, Boolean algebras of event spaces. And it has these very elementary properties of or, an, and true and false. And I won't go through them. They're just very, very simple properties. <coughs> and when you have an algebra with these properties, it's called a lattice. And lattices 
are nice algebraic, uh, fundamental algebraic structures. They're like groups. They're important like groups. They're very simple algebraic structures. And we'll take them as a starting point as what a logic is or what an event space is. And we will then expand upon it by putting probability functions on them and seeing what the results are. Okay. Um, okay. The lattice is said to be a Boolean lattice, corresponding to a Boolean algebra, if it has a complementation operator, has a little dot such that it satisfies the law of complementation in this rule called distributivity that goes back to uh, the early 1900s. And this is called a Boolean lattice. And a Boolean lattice has all the algebraic properties of the Boolean algebra events that we use in probability theory. And we can go to it this way. A lattice of this form is called a set lattice, where this is a non-empty set, this is the empty set, this is a collection of subsets of the non-empty set. And these are operations that act like union and intersection, but they're not union, necessarily union and intersection. They're just operations on the set of, on this grip X. And each lattice is isomorphic to a set lattice. So if I have a lattice, I can find a set lattice that's isomorphic to it. And I'll use these set lattices as generalizations of uh, the event lattices for probability. And there's a Stone representation theorem that says each Boolean lattice, so if this is distributive and complemented, has a complementation operator, is isomorphic to a Boolean algebra of events. So if I have a complementation operator, essentially, as far as the algebra and as far as the logic goes, I'm almost at the point of, algebraically at the point of Boolean algebra, if this principle of distributivity here holds. So to look for generalizations, you look for generalizations where distributivity is going to fail. The first generalization of this, well, we'll get to it in a second. Um, if this is a complemented lattice, I'm not assuming distributivity here, just complementation then it's said to satisfy De Morgan's laws if it satisfies these basic laws of logic due to De Morgan and that people are familiar with. And a complemented lattice satis satisfying De Morgan's laws is called an ortholattice. So Neumann thought that these were natural conditions uh, to uh, enter in. If you're to bring complementation in, then you want minimum properties that complementation should satisfy and he thought that these classical properties of complementation were uh, a good idea to have. I also looked at systems where we don't have complementation. We have weaker forms of complementation all the way to no complementation and probability theories on it. But that's uh, a different type of theory that I'm presenting today. So in uh, 1936, um, Birkhoff and von Neumann produce a seminal uh, work on the uh, logic of quantum mechanics. And this is what they assumed. They assumed that they had an ortho lattice, so this was a complementation operator, and it had this condition, which is weaker than uh, uh, distributivity called modularity. And this condition of modularity was uh, investigated uh, rather extensively in the early 1900s because it turns out that in group theory it's an important condition uh, uh, about how normal subgroups are related to one another. <coughs> and in geometry, this type of lattice ends up being what one gets in projective geometry. <coughs> But uh, in von Neumann and Morgan <coughs> and uh, Birkhoff and von Neumann, they use this as the, these as what event spaces will be for quantum mechanics. So von Neumann 
I believe it was von Neumann mainly, it's in their paper, uh, believed that how <coughs> quantum physics differed from quantum mechanics, differed from classical mechanics was in this rule right here of modularity. Classical mechanics had to assume the event space to be distributive and quantum mechanics used this rule of modularity. And so they basically said that what you had was when you did quantum mechanics, it's a type of science, uh, applied science, you had a probability theory. I haven't said the probability side yet. The probability theory has an event space. That's the logical structure of what you're dealing with in quantum mechanics. And then you add to that structure physical laws and their dynamics, and that's quantum mechanics. So they separated they separated out the logical structure from the actual dynamics and the physics. And what Jennifer has used and uh, some other people is taking the logical structure of quantum mechanics, throwing away the dynamics because they want to do psychology. And so people don't communicate with each other like subatomic particles or um, um, and, um, uh, and uh, use it for characterizing uh, types of situations in psychology. And I'll talk about doing that in a quite different way. There was a problem with uh, 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 von Neumann and, and uh, some Birkhoff von Neumann's formulation who slew me in 1937, a year later, decided that if you really can do quantum mechanics, you need a more general law called orthomodularity. That this was more general than modularity that um, uh, Birkhoff and von Neumann was using. Uh, and that one actually needed this to do quantum mechanics. Birkhoff and von Neumann was aware of this law, but they actually thought that at the time that they can capture all the physical laws without going to this more general kind of law. I won't go into what it is. It looks kind of reasonable that what happens if A is a subset of B, then you can solve it by taking a union of something that's disjoint. Oh, that's very reasonable in a Boolean algebra, but in these more general structures, um, <laughs> It ends up being a kind of powerful condition. And uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, and so what happened is, he says this is what quantum logic should be. And, um, and that takes up to 1937. From 1937 to uh, 1955, there was no publications on quantum logic. It seemed to have disappeared or the interest, people had other interests. Then it uh, came back in about 1955, 1956. There was uh, Loomis, who was a mathematician, rediscovered uh, uh, the orthomodular law and started to use it. And then um, all of a sudden, uh, people in philosophy got interested in the foundations of, uh, of quantum mechanics and start producing uh, articles. A number of mathematicians uh, got involved and physicists got involved and it's just a gigantic field today. <coughs> and uh, most of it is uh, certainly the philosophical literature is focused on um, orthomodular, orthomodular lattices. Um, but uh, I won't go into uh, all the different uh, ways that people have dealt with the problem. But what about probability function? We don't have a Boolean algebra, and um, uh, uh, I have a cutoff here. Uh, P is said to be, uh, and so we have a little bit different definition of probability. We generalized our event space, so now we have to generalize our notion of probability to sort of match the underlying logic of the event space. We don't have 
the Boolean algebra of events are more powerful than the type of event space we're dealing with in quantum logic. The Boolean algebra is, is more powerful and therefore we can have a stronger algebraic structure. On the other hand, the generalization is richer in concepts. So we have very rich types of concepts that we can introduce that we can't get in Boolean algebra that just becomes degenerate. So we have a notion of an orthoprobability function on just a ortho lattice right now. It's a probability function that sort of like sure event is one, empty event is zero for all A, B. If A is a sub proper subset of B, then P of A is less than P of B. I don't use uh, sets of measure zero and there's a, a reason for it. It's not critical. I can introduce measure zero, but I need this in this definition. And if V is, well, just look at this as V is in uh, the uh, complement of A. So V is in the this is put the little dot over it. V is in the complement of A. Then the probability of A union B is the sum of the probability of A and the probability of B. So it's the same definition of probability theory except we're not just looking at disjoint events, we're looking at events that are in this particular complement of A. It turns out that these um, uh, lattices can have many complementation operations. Some are better than others for what we want. One is of the complementation operations will be a, a uh, satisfies the Morgan's law and if this relationship holds, then we have that the probability of A union B is the sum. It's a generalization. For Boolean algebras, an orthoprobability function is a probability function. And um, a, uh, a Boolean algebra is a, is a special case of uh, things we're looking at. But here's the main theorem. Suppose P is an orthoprobability function on X then X is orthomodular. X satisfies that funny orthomodular law. Now if you're like me and didn't really understand the real subtleties of the orthomodular law, I don't need it if I have a probability function. Now I'm going to talk about doing psychology and we gather our data with probability functions. We have probability functions there. So what I'm going only going to assume is that I have an orthoprobability function uh, on a ortho lattice and then I will get orthomodularity as a consequence and thus I will have quantum logic as a special case. They become a special case because this person in the in 1971 showed that some orthomodular lattices cannot have orthoprobability functions defined on them which makes you wonder why philosophers are so enamored with orthomodular lattices and talk about them for quantum mechanics or generalization when you can't do any science on them because you can't have a good probability function on some of them, right? It's, it's the wrong concept for uh, generative science. Of course, they like to do things that are not part of science like put inference implication relations on and saying what deductions are and other things are good for that, but they're not useful for science except for the subset that has orthoprobability functions on it. So my idea is, um, well, let's not worry about um, where things, the real metaphysics, uh, uh, like uh, Jennifer and, uh, uses uh, Hilbert space to uh, start with her orthomodular thing. Then some people criticize her and say, why Hilbert space? Where did it come from? Uh, um, I'm fortunate they, uh, they're not here, first of all. That's very fortunate. But the other <laughs> reason why I'm fortunate, even if they were here, they couldn't criticize me on that ground because I'm just starting off with, uh, uh, I'm going to find out or demonstrate how I get the ortho lattice 
And then, uh, since I'm a scientist, I collect probabilities, and I'll have a probability function at ortho lattice, and uh, I'll have orthomodularity, and it'll turn out that that's all I need. And so I'm going to uh, uh, get a little bit involved. So what I'm going to talk about is experimental psychological uh, paradigms. It is true that some of the insights that I get come from uh, not understanding quantum mechanics by looking at pictures where people have little diagrams from quantum mechanics. I can understand the diagrams. Um, uh, I can understand some of the uh, uh, Taoist interpretations of quantum mechanics, but that's not too useful here. But as far as actual quantum mechanics go, I don't really understand what's going on. Um, but I don't need to, because I'm going to be talking about psychology. And when I'm talking about psychology, I'm going to do it the way psychologists do it. I'm going to use in the background um, uh, a uh, regular probability function. We gather probabilities the same way. Boolean event spaces, just like we do in psychology. And, um, and uh, talk about psychological experiments, not these funny quantum experiments. But we'll show that all the funny quantum phenomena can appear in psychological experiments. And, um, and look at it uh, different. There will be one thing I'll do that is kind of different, is that I will formalize a type of reasoning and concepts that are not used in a formal way in psychology or psychological thinking. And I'll get to that later. So let's talk about what an experimental psychological paradigm is. Uh, it, has just, it has just a bunch of subjects and a uh, bunch of experiments. And you take some subjects, you put some subjects in some experiments, and other subjects in other experiments. The experiments are different, and then this is where the informal stuff that never gets said happens. Yes, we know how to analyze an experiment because we have all these books. This is how you analyze an experiment. Uh, Jay has all these programs. Use my programs. You could do better experiments. We understand what an experiment is, but we don't really get that much information out of a single experiment. We get a lot of information by running a series of experiments and then reasoning between the experiments. Because of each of the experiments being different, in some sense, their outcomes are different because subjects were put in different conditions. They were asked different questions. So we have to somehow reason between different experiments and these type of outcomes. Fortunately, in philosophy, uh, they have uh, a way of thinking about this. And even more so, they uh, uh, formalize this and it's called counterfactual logic. And that's what I'll be using. OK? But anyway, um, I'll look at between subject experiments. It's the simplest case. And, um, uh, and then I'll talk about uh, some other ex forms of experiments using. The formalism for a between subject experiment has two parts. You have the data, which consists of, of which subject participated in which experiment and which outcomes you chose. And the theory, which consists of counterfactual statements relating subjects' behaviors across paradigm experiments. If a subject answers question in one experiment, and I really want to think about what his data means in another experiment, I go through this type of thinking that humans are very good at. Children are very good at. They can do pretend. Pretend this happened rather than that. Well, counterfactual logic is based upon that type of reasoning. So in the uh, counterfactual statements is, I wonder, or I theorize, or I state as a hypothesis what the subject who answered the question in this experiment was expected or did, did in some other experiment. Okay, So it's counterfactual because the other experiment was never run. So there's something called counterfactual logic, where you do logic thinking about these things. And the best way of saying it is, it's 
a disorderly field <laughs> of, uh, of uh, philosophy. It's very important. It has some good results, and, uh, but it's a very difficult kind of field. For us, it's not so difficult because all we have to do is think about what we normally do in psychological experiments and the way that we draw our conclusions and then just formalize those. Philosophers have a much more difficult uh, type of job uh, than that. So what I'm interested in to begin with is what I call determinable events. So uh, uh, over here, uh, O is the uh, set of outcomes of the paradigm. So each experiment has a set of outcomes. The experiments are indexed because they're different. The outcomes in the experiment are indexed because even though they might look like the same outcome, receiving $5 in one experiment, and they say receive $5 in another experiment, $5 are not the same. They were run in different experiments, so we index it with an I. And something you'll see is something I learned from John Claude, always index everything, and then in the end say which indexes don't matter. But never uh, leave out an index. So uh, the other thing is, is the union of all of these outcomes. Each of these things are distinct because they're indexed. Okay? So the formalism of a <coughs> between-subject experiment has two parts. <coughs> the data, which consists of which subject participated in which experiment and which outcome she chose and a theory which consists of counterfactual statements relating the behavior across, the subject's behavior across the paradigm's experiments. So I have a theory I'm testing, just as if you do quantum mechanics, you have a theory, you write down some equations. So I'm gonna write down statements that relate one experiment to another experiment, test my theory. I use my data to test my theory and I also use the data to generate other experiments to test the theory. This is how I'm going to proceed. Has nothing to do with quantum mechanics except some distant history of how the ideas came about. Okay, do I have anything more on here? Okay, that's the theory. So if, uh, if uh, O is an outcome and S is a subject, then S is said to actually have chosen O, if and only if S participated in experiment EI and chose O in some experiment. So S is said to counterfactually chosen O if and only if the outcome. S did not participate in EI, but would have chosen O if she would have participated in EI. This is the counterfactual thing. It assumed that each subject has a counterfactual choice for each experiment she does not participate in. Sometimes this choice may be specified by theory and, uh, and uh, data. Other times it may be unknown. Okay, so if my theory, if I have a piece of data about the subject and my theory tells me what she would do in another experiment, then it is specified there as well. There'll be times when I only know what the subject did in a particular experiment. I don't have data on the other part, and my theory doesn't tell what she did on the other part. Okay, a, an event in the power set of O. So let's talk about O. O is a set of all outcomes across all experiments. I'm gonna take the power set of O, that's a set of events. These events go across all experiments some are restricted to a given experiment, but in general they go across, they can combine things across experiments. That will be my event space. I'll put a probability function on that event space based upon my theory and data. So it's a standard uh, a probability function on a standard event space. The events in these event space are counterfactually defined. So it's not a regular event space. It contains subsets of the events, which are actual <laughs> events that we have actual data on, but um, it contains a lot of other things. 
So it's said to be determinable if and only if each subject of the paradigm subjects that could be determined from the paradigm's data in theory that for each O and A, for each um, outcome in A, either act, S actually chose A or act I mean, kept A, right? kept A. S actually chose cap A here, or S counterfactually chose cap A. Okay? This means it's determined, it means for a given subject, I know for that outcome what happened. Okay? I can know because I have a piece of data, and I can know that because my theory, with whatever data I have, tells me what has happened. But it's determined. Um, and you let D be the set of determinable events. These are the events that we know a lot about. There's other events we don't know much about. We're not going to worry about those. We're only going to worry about the ones that we know a lot about. Then using the uh, paradigm theory, in addition to the data, the following can be computed um, uh, for uh, these determinable events. Okay, the number of A, <coughs> this is the number of participants from which the paradigm's data in theory it can be determined for each O and A, S actually chose A, it should be capital A, or S counterfactually chose A. So this would be determinable events. Okay, and so if we have a determinable event, we, it just means that we could determine the subjects for, and what they did in that event. For each finite set T, this is the size of T, the number of elements of T. Um, note that the size of A is exactly known because we know for each subject exactly what that subject did for each element of the set. Maybe I got wrong. Uh, uh, and in other words, it could be determined for each O N A for each element of O. N A. X actually chose O or o. counterfactually chose O. Right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And therefore, we know for. Um, uh, therefore, we know exactly the people who made a choice or a counterfactual choice in A, and we also know what that choice is. Okay, well, do we have this? Okay. Uh, so the size of A is exactly known. Because the paradigm assumes that each outcome in O is actually chosen by some subject, the size of A is always positive. Okay. So. So in, uh, in science, uh, paradigms are designed to draw conclusions across the paradigms are designed to draw conclusions across the experiments. To model these in a systematic way, data from the paradigms and part of the paradigm theory will be mapped into a lattice structure based on these determinable events. Probabilities will play an important role in the characterization of this lattice structure. Now here is the only tricky part. All oh, this is just saying, we're just going to look at what we know <laughs> to begin with. But um, the problem is, well, we haven't got to the, uh, the tricky part yet. So, um, uh, uh, so P is a function defined on D by the following thing. We just take the size, the probability is the size of A over the uh, size of uh, of uh, uh, the set of outcomes, which is determinable. We know everything about uh, this will just, not determinable, this will give us a probability function. Okay. Uh, P is called the paradigm's determinability function. It, well, we define this. It's called the paradigm's determinability function. It assigns each determinable event a number that exactly determines the paradigm's data in theory. I'm not saying yet it's a uh, probability function. I'm saying it here, but I have to demonstrate it has the right rules. Um, so I'll continue with this. 
this is the, um, uh, the one part that is a little tricky. Even though we can be finding probability for all these determinable events, um, it's not probability as assigning a number to each of the determinable events. Uh, D does not have the appropriate algebraic structure to be a uh, uh, domain of an interesting probability function. In other words, I have a probability function defined on D, but it won't have the right properties because D does not have the right, rel right algebraic properties. If I assume several things about D, like it's a Hilbert space or closed subsets of a Hilbert space or something, and it has the right properties, if I don't have anything, I haven't assumed anything about D except I can, uh, except it's determinable. So I have to map D into a subset of this domain, take a subset in a manner that preserves not probabilities and uh, um, uh, preserves, uh, that preserves probabilities, elements of this subset are called propositions. So I have to go and tell you what a proposition is and uh, why we're using it. A is said to be a D proposition or just a proposition for short if A is in D and if D is in D, then this holds. The same set of people from which I can determine whether or not for each outcome that is in D is the same as the set of people who I can determine whether for each outcome in A it's in A or counterfactually in A and similarly in D. This defines a, uh, this really gives rise to equivalence relations between A and B. And what happens is in this equivalence class, there's the largest one, and that's what I'm picking as A. So what a D proposition is, I have an equivalence class defined by this. The equivalence class has the largest element, namely taking the union of all the A's, all the B's that are, well, it's easy to see it has the largest element, and I'm calling that particular element the uh, D uh, a D proposition. A and B contain, for all purposes of psychological analysis, exactly the same information. It tells me my real information is what subject does what and what experiment and what am I assuming about that subject. It's the same. <laughs> so we let this be the set of D propositions. Now this set has all the right algebraic properties and, uh, and by definition pi of A for A and D stands for the unique proposition in pi such that pi of, uh, pi of A is equal to the number of objects in A. Well. So pi of A, for each, proper, for each proposition, pi of A gives me the set of people who uh, I can determine uh, for each outcome in A uh, that uh, they chose A or counterfactually chose A. And then what I'm able to do is I'm able to define this union by just taking, uh, for propositions, by just taking uh, the uh, uh, people in A and the people in B, and if I did this right, taking the proposition that corresponds to those people, and similarly for the intersection, and with this definition, I get that these things, I prove that these things are in um, the set of propositions and then what happens is I do, uh, I use this probability function I define and I end up with this being an ortho lattice where this is set to the ready complementation and P is a probability function on this lattice. So in summary, what I do is I 
I'll just summarize. I take the determinable events. I take their equivalence classes. Uh, I put an equivalence relation on them. I take the largest element of the equivalence relation that exists, call that a proposition, and it has all the relevant properties of the things that it is equivalent to. And uh, using that, I define a union and like an intersection-like operation on it, and I use set theoretic complementation, and I get an ortho lattice and the ortho lattice, and I get a probability function, and I get that um, this is um, a, uh, um, and then this comes out to be an orthomodular lattice because of a theorem I proved earlier. In summary, I get the same type of structure that one gets in quantum logic with the probability function to boot. Just sell considerations of what you're doing in psychological experiments. The trick is I have to look at things that are determinable. But in quantum mechanics, they do the same thing. They look at things that are observable or, and that you can measure. Okay, so it's orthomodular. So how much time do I have? Um, Let's see. Okay. Okay. So I'll. <laughs> I'll, ta I'll take them. That's right. Yeah. If it was a city council meeting, I'd be going to the end. But, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So um, uh, here's a physics example from Foley and Randall. But I won't go through the example. It's basically. Uh, uh, that you have one experiment where you uh, uh, look at uh, things and you measure their masses. You have two things, you measure their masses. Another one, you measure their momentum. And there's uh, uh, and there's some quantum effect that you look at. But what they end up doing in their article is they produce a lattice. I don't need to know physics. I just say, look at this lattice. It doesn't look at all like a Boolean algebra. And this is the type of lattice of propositions they get using my language. And the question is, can I do a, um, a psychological experiment and get the same lattice? <coughs> I only chose this lattice because I had a uh, picture of it from something else. But I can just go through and take any of them and come up with experiments. And for Don Sari, since he's around, we'll just come up with voting experiments. So um, uh, here's, the, here's something that will give me exactly the same uh, uh, lattice. Consider a situation where there are two committees, one and two. These are two experiments with no member in common that are assigned to choose among three candidates, X, Y, and Z, to lead a company. X and Y can be have similar visions for the company, and Z has a radically different vision. Assume the choice is done by a vote, with each committee member of each committee providing a single vote for her preferred candidate. And then this is how it models with the thing, right? But what is the um, uh, uh, idea here is that on the first committee, anybody who voted for X and Y would have voted for X and Y if they were on the second committee, and the person on the second committee similarly. And so uh, this is a situation, and, and similarly for Z. If they vote for Z on the first committee, if they were on the second committee, they would have voted for Z. This gives rise to this lattice that you see in quantum mechanics. Of course, there's all sorts of dynamics, and this is a very important lattice that turns out in quantum mechanics. Uh, this isn't important about anything. <laughs> uh, but we can always find a type of analogy uh, using these methods. Why counterfactual logic is so rich that you can do whatever you want 
in counterfactual logic, which is one of the problems with it. But we're, we are, we're very limited in what we can do because we have experiments and data and rules we're going to write down about what we can do. So, um, uh, okay. So, uh, I don't have too much time to go into the, uh, the lie paradox. Um, uh, that'll take too long, I guess. So, I'll just talk about counterfactual. Uh, propositional space. I call this counterfactual propositional space. Now, what we have is um, remember I put indices on all the outcomes. But what I can do is I can say in reality, two of these outcomes are going to be the same. And this happens all the time in quantum mechanics. But how do I want to say that? The way I'm going to say it here is, is that the two outcomes being the same means, I'm giving a special meaning to it, that every subject who chose outcome one and experiment one chose outcome one prime and experiment two, and vice versa. Okay, so outcome one got chosen if and only if outcome one prime did not get chosen. This doesn't mean that outcome one can need look anything like outcome one prime in psychological experiments. I have a feeling in quantum mechanics there's sort of a different meaning that they use for identity. So I can identify oh. those two things because I can't distinguish them from by data or theory. And therefore, if they're a proposition, they're the same proposition. Okay? So things I can't distinguish by theory or data going across that are determinable are going to be treated as the same object. That means in propositional space, if I look at one of these objects, it exists in propositional space. When I run it in, if I look at it in terms of experiment one, it means one thing. If I look at an experiment two, it means something different. But in propositional space, uh, in counterfactual space, it's the same thing. And it has now different properties. Right, so this is what the, uh, the the trick is. This is if there's any connection to quantum mechanics, it's there about the ident about certain things get identified, and these things act like projections down onto the experiments. So I have that idea built in. So then, what you want to do is ask the question: If I go to counterfactual space, take all my experiments all my data, now look at in counterfactual space, do I get any additional insights than I would have if I just stayed down in the very observable real world and not go up to this space? What can I do in counterfactual space that I can't do in regular space? Well, <coughs> this is... Uh, uh, one idea is, uh, since I am an orthomodular lattice, fortunately there's been an enormous amount of mathematical research on these lattices, and I can use some of that research. One is the concept of a block containing a proposition A. So a proposition A is, a, is an event. Uh, a block is containing A is the largest Boolean algebras of propositions containing A. There is such a Boolean algebra because its complement and it form a Boolean algebra. So there is one, and they can prove that there is the largest one, and that's called a block. What an experiment is, when you run an experiment, it's a block. It's a Boolean algebra. I know all the probabilities, I know all the events. It's a block. Each of those are blocks. But there can be additional blocks. Each additional block 
if you can realize it as an experiment, there'll be lots of blocks, is a new experiment to run. Right? Not only is there a new experiment to run, you already know what the probabilities that your theory tells you that that experiment should have. So this is a good way of testing your theory. You're testing your theory on a new experiment that are built out of pieces of other experiments that get also identified <laughs> in this bigger space. So that's the first uh, uh, type of thing. And that's done in uh, quantum mechanics, and that's a standard type of thing, I, I think. And uh, the second one is um, symmetries and meaningful relations in counterfactual space. Well, we have all these objects in counterfactual space, but what sort of relationships are, are going to be worthwhile? How are we going to find laws and things like that? Well, we find laws by looking at symmetries. One way we already got laws was by saying if I have two indexes, two, two um, uh, outcomes and two different experiments, I can sort of ignore their index and give them a symbol for a single outcome, treat it as one sort of outcome by the if and only if. At least in, 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 uh, it's one outcome in uh, uh, counterfactual space. So we can do certain things by those indexes. But eliminating the indexes is part of something more general. Underlying all of this in your um, um, counterfactual space is the uh, set of outcomes. And one can look at automorphisms or symmetries on a set of outcomes that preserves your structure. These correspond to types of transformations that one does in linear transformations in quantum mechanics. One can look at those, and what you want to do is look at relations that are invariant under those or particular subsets of those. It turns out that uh, there are interesting types of different symmetries, and they produce some interesting properties. Those are the ones that are really going to tell you what's going on across the various uh, types of structures. And um, I haven't uh, looked at this because I haven't really got any real data <laughs> or examples to put into this. But in general, this is what I think I have accomplished with this stage of it. That this, this is all very recent work and um, kind of preliminary. But Other things you could add to it as well. That it's it's meaningfulness. It's so it's telling you what new things you should look for that your theory is implying across all the experiments. And that'll be useful because it's a different way of thinking about what's going on. You might have a hypothesis that this is important and it may turn out not to be invariant under the automorphism, which means you have to add new assumptions. You want to say, what new ideas can I get without adding new assumptions? That's the, uh, the value of it. Um, so what I think I have accomplished here is uh, going about uh, the quantum logic in a different way. Starting out with psychology, types of things we do in psychology, adding only one little thing from philosophy, which is this counterfactual uh, event space, um, uh, and uh, using standard probability theory in the background because we define probability in a standard way, and ending up with something like quantum mechanics. Why am I able to do this? And the reason why I'm able to do it is also the reason why I can't generalize it back to quantum mechanics. It's because we have a set of subjects. <laughs> All my counterfactual reasoning had to do with what subjects would do in one thing and another, and counting subjects to get the probability function. We use the, the subjects in a special role to talk about the propositions. 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, you might, but it may not be as general. Right, you're talking in. Um, okay, yeah, so I, that's, that's it. According to the schedule, we have five minutes for okay. questions. No questions? Any questions? Well, one of you can pretend to be Jeff. that doesn't doesn't have any role for random variables or anything like random variables you are dealing with events only I have not um, uh, looked into that okay I, this is just the first thing that came uh, mm. to mind I do this thing like random variables uh, I took the simplest case where you had um, uh, uh, a between subject experiment. But another way of thinking about the data set, something isomorphic in terms of data and everything, the between subject experiment, is an individual subject. And this individual subject is characterized by the following thing. Uh, the individual subject has a set of states. And when he's in state one, and you put him in experiment one, he looks like person one. Well, he looks like the distribution of the uh, population of people who took experiment one. There's a certain probability for each outcome. That's his probability function. You put him in experiment two, that's his probability function. Those are random variables. So I can transfer in an isomorphic way what I've done for an individual subject acting on random variables in the experiment with the state and everything else that goes through formally. Yeah, maybe that would make it more. Right, so that's looking at from the point of view of individual subjects. Why I focused instead doing the between subject experiment is you can understand why everything was done if I really presented it very clearly, you got to understand why everything was done in a particular way it was done. And it'd be very hard to disagree with anything. When I talk about an individual subject, then. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering how you avoid uh, the outlandishness that you get sometimes with counterfactual reasoning. So for example, if someone might say, if ice were denser than water, then ice would sink rather than float. Lakes would freeze solid from the bottom up. The fish would be forced to the surface, and we'd go ice fishing by walking out on the ice and picking up the fish. Yes, so I, I uh, uh, yes, you do well in philosophy. Uh, I get out of that, first of all, I don't have an implication operator. I'm not doing logic. And I'm not doing counterfactual reasoning. I'm using a counterfactual event space for doing types of reasoning that people do in psychological experiments. Now, I agree in reviewing papers, but sometimes we see that logic you're talking about. <laughs> but it doesn't get very far. So uh, I'm not trying to characterize uh, uh, natural reasoning and about counterfactuals, or time doing tense logic, or any of those sort of things. What is the real difference? 
when we do counterfactual logic, the emphasis uh, by philosophers and logicians are on the notion of truth, how you, you define what truth is, and then you see which sorts of things get preserved as you go from possible world to possible world. That's not here. If it's here in such an obvious, if it is there at all, it's in such an obvious way, it doesn't matter. None of the subtleties. The other problem you have in um, uh, dealing in philosophy of possible worlds is identifying people across possible worlds. If Julian, uh, Julius Caesar didn't cross the Rubicon, then uh, Rome would never have had emperors. Well, is he Julius Caesar if he didn't cross the Rubicon? They'll argue this or something like it. I don't have to worry about things like that. That's the things that counterfactual logic uh, deals with and worries about. This is, is rather specific in where the probability, where the lattice comes in, and why the lattice is there by determinability and what we're using is awful lot clearer. And those issues get avoided. Okay, well, thank you.